Okay, so as you all probably know, the Zizek and Peterson debate finally happened. More of a dialogue turned into more of a dialogue. And um, I think there are a lot of points of synthesis, and I'm not going to get into who I think won or um, little points here and there. I'm really trying to build on the video I made before the debate happened by pointing out some of the uh, dimensions where I think this discussion um, helps us to articulate a certain horizon. So I do think, and I, I said before the debate, I think there are four main areas that I was paying attention to for um, possible synthetic dialogue. That was one, an end to the neoliberal pleasure principle. Two, the affirmation of intense psychical vicissitudes. Three, new discourse on the individual and the collective. And four, the integration of historical darkness and shadows. And when I was going through the topics that were discussed by Zizek and Peterson, I sort of filtered them through uh, these four lenses um, to try to find some common points of interest where their dialogue brought us to uh, either resolutions or identification of a useful way to think of these four dimensions. So, starting with an end to the neoliberal pleasure principle, I would say that this this uh, structure of the neoliberal pleasure principle is essentially um, the instantiation of a life world which is regulated by simple pleasures and um, conducive to uh, the expansion of capitalism for capitalism's sake. Um, and I think both Zizek and Peterson agreed that um, if we are to live true lives, uh, if we are to live true lives filled with meaning throughout the, uh, the wholeness of our existence, that we must posit a cause above and beyond pleasure. This is, of course, in connection with Freud's uh, identification of a beyond of the pleasure principle. But this self-posited cause, no one can tell you what your cause is. Um, but the idea is, is that if you really go deep into yourself and you figure out what it is that moves you, uh, independent of just simple pleasures, then uh, pleasure and happiness will just simply come as a byproduct of you uh, uh, pursuing your cause. And of course, that's going to be a huge tension. It's going to be a huge struggle to, to live your life for a higher cause. Um, but it's also the only way to generate meaning. This is connected to um, the mechanism of self-responsibility as a way to overcome uh, pathological prohibition. So the, the, the reason why this point came up to me was because not only because Peterson always emphasizes self-responsibility as, as central and, and a needed uh, um, complement to our discourse on rights, but also something that really interests Zizek which is that when you negate or deconstruct the old paternal um, prohibitions, the patriarchy, uh, the superego, um, we do not enter into a um, free, uh, playful universe where everyone is simply enjoying their pleasures. We enter into a universe almost where we become static and fixed and we have all of these built-up internal tensions and we have all these built-up um uh, uh prohibitions which we which we uh unconsciously use to regulate our own activity um and the only way i think that we can overcome this internal deadlock this internal static fixedness is by taking self responsibility for our life on the largest time scale that we can conceive which might be somewhat similar to the insistence that Peterson makes of the long-term iterative game, that the point of a self-becoming um, is to instantiate a game on the individual level, on the family level, on the social level, on the community level, on the planetary level, which can be iterated as best as possible in an upward direction over the course of a whole existence. Now, um, the final point I wanted to make on this end of the pleasure principle is that um, when you're just being regulated by basically like a bubble of happiness, 
Uh, this does not allow for true love. I think both Zizek and Peterson agree that real love is more of a, a it's beyond both pleasure and happiness. It's, it's when you're really living um, for something that's, that means more than yourself. That could be another person or it could be a, a cause or a, an event or, 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 or something else. But that love is in some sense a catastrophe from the perspective of the ego because it totally derails you from your simple, normal, day-to-day -day existence. And so the end of the neoliberal pleasure principle should also open us into a horizon of real love, um, which is absolute and self-evident. The second thing I, I used to structure their, uh, uh, my analysis of their debate was the affirmation of intense psychical vicissitudes. So this is basically saying that when we live in relationship to pleasure and happiness, we're trying to guard ourselves or shield ourselves from basically the reality that our psychical drives are difficult. There are ups and downs. And um, basically... Even though we're free, it's not a romantic freedom. We don't want to be free in some sense. There's a lot of us who would prefer the safety and comfort of unfreedom than the difficult burden, burden of real freedom. Um, because when you affirm real freedom and you're actually making real choices with all of your day-to-day -day activities and all of the things that you really want to accomplish in life instead of keeping them unconsciously at a safe distance... Um, Freedom is a burden um, and a huge responsibility. Um, and w as we approach the future horizon, um, we are forced to be free. Um, we must we must make decisions that are aligned with that space of um, free choice, which we all have accessible to us at any moment. Um, the second point with the affirmation of psycho psychological vicissitudes is that we are a very strange species, and I think Zizek made and highlighted this point perfectly, specifically in relationship to Peterson's lobster comments, in relationship to the differentiation between humans and animals, where even though we are regulated by instincts, just like other organisms, our instincts are always, and this is a psychoanalytic point, our instincts are always filtered through language and through and language as an unconscious structure. And so our instincts become metaphysical passions. So we don't just eat and drink and sleep and fuck and, and, and socialize and build a home as regulated by genetics. Um, there's always an excess to all of these activities which charge it with a irrational metaphysical dimension, perhaps especially in sex, but also with food and also with home and also with socializing, also with political power. So I think that in that sense, that is one of the reasons why um, we want to, in some sense, in our current era, live in a realm of deconstruction because we want to pretend that this irrational, extra, very excessive dimension is in some sense at a distance, but it can't be at a distance. We have to own it. And in the past, all of this metaphysical excess was obviously regulated by religions, but we don't regulate ourselves by religion anymore. So again, it comes down to our own responsibility to instantiate the rituals that will keep us living in a meaningful world throughout the course of an entire life history. Um, and then finally, um, in relationship to uh, the metaphysical principle, um, there is a, I think, common agreement between both Zizek and Peterson that even though happiness is not the main goal, happiness, again, is a byproduct, that um, that we are in some sense in a fall. And this fall, uh, as Zizek, uh, I think, most succinctly identified, is not a transcendent perfect unity but a fundamental separation. This is obviously represented in Christianity with Jesus on the cross, that Jesus is separated from God um, and God is separated from himself as well. Um, so that our separation, our feeling of lack, our feeling that we aren't whole, our feeling that we are still irreducibly um, open and incomplete, this is our very divinity. This is the location of our divinity. And so when we accept this, when we affirm 
intense psychological vicissitudes, we are affirming at the same time our own divinity. Um, and that should be a place where both Zizek and Peterson agree because, as Peterson always says, the, he believes the Logos is divine and, and, and always emphasizing the individual and Judeo-Christian tradition. So I think they're aligned with this as well. On a third point, connected to new discourse on the individual and the collective, we can p pick up where we left off with intense psychological vicissitudes because once we affirm a beyond of the pleasure principle and the intense psychological vicissitudes, we have to then gravitate and, and graduate even our discourse to the level of the collective. And this is something where Peterson really fails and, and where Zizek really interjected and, and um, made some precise comments that are um, essential for, in the end, bringing them together because as they both believe our, our current uh, discourse on the collective is all politically correct nonsense and um, basically surface level identitarian categories dominate our social analysis and that this is just um, not getting to the core of real social change and not getting to the core of the real problems, the underlying tensions, which at least from Zizek's point of view are fundamentally socioeconomic and political economic, which is why he feels the Marxist categories and uh, you know, Marx's books on capital are still of essential importance to understand and to study, in which I agree. Um, so the way to go beyond political correctness is to reinvent our socioeconomic and political economic categories. And I think that we do see a pathway forward in this discourse with the debate between equality and hierarchy. And for me, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. On the left, we should revive... you. Uh, emphasis on universal access and universal access in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of the basic fighting principles that the left has always fought for, where we have a society where um, not every not every identity category is going to be equally represented in every social hierarchy, but that everyone in a society has equal access to the basic needs they, they that they that they require for survival and that this then leads to the establishment of um, fair, more fair hierarchies um, and essentially hierarchies that allow the uh, expression of pure difference of potentiality all humans have different potentials we're not going to change that um, some you know some humans are better at some things and some, and some humans are better at other things and there's a whole bunch of things in which many different humans are going to be good at and there's going to be radical differences in those abilities and who knows what different differences will emerge as 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 our potentials express but basically hierarchies will form around those differences and as long as it's as long as it's a free and open competition um I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So I think that 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 helps the dialogue, and and that helps us get beyond this constant, um, uh, con, you know, conservative uh, paralysis with wanting to preserve old hierarchies. We don't need to preserve old hierarchies necessarily. If those hierarchies don't serve us anymore, then let's get rid of them. But hierarchies will form, and 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 there's nothing wrong with that. So um, I, I I I like the concept of heterarchy, for example. Uh, the third point is, in order for this to move forward, in order us to, for us to move beyond political correctness, and in order for us, for a synth in order for us to synthesize equality and hierarchy, we need to have large-scale capitalist regulation. And that's essentially a problem of the commons, which is basically a problem of an international order. It's not something that nation-states can solve. There needs to be a new way of thinking the international dimension. And commons is basically the identification of a problem, the problem of ecological large-scale issues like both of them identified the problem of the ecology of the oceans and that no nation state can handle that and the market can't handle that so it needs a large scale regulation because capitalism as it as it operates uh, fundamentally is trying to maximize profit and so in that sense it's 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 not going to be able to to do to do the job and there's many other dimensions where capitalism is just not going to be able to do the job so that's common sense and i think um i think peterson was was hopefully swayed by the by by that point and i think it ultimately was emphasizing that you can't have a pol socioeconomic socio political economic category which commodifies our entire planet that's just you know that i i don't think anyone is really for that fourth 
And finally, the integration of historical darkness and shadows. And I think that here, again, they're very uh, aligned because they both emphasize, although Peterson emphasizes more the good and emphasizes more that like we have to develop our best self in order to overcome the evil that he, you know, that is fundamental to human species. And we see that as evidence in the 20th century with large scale catastrophes. Um, Zizek also always emphasizes our evilness and even goes so far as to say that evil, we should never underestimate evil. Um, and essentially we should be very careful with the way we develop our self narratives but at the same time we do need to better understand our self narratives and we have to have a more transparent understanding of our cognitive mapping but i would say the emphasis that both of them would agree on is that we can't have our narratives cover up our real darkness that our narratives have to include our real darkness we have to be we have to approach our darkness we have to go closer to our darkness we have to be, be aware that it's within us and our narratives are just a shield or a mask unless they do that, unless they achieve that function. So I think that's a huge work. Um, and that allows us to basically have a larger and more complex conversation about the nature of good and evil and the nature of ethics. And I think here, yeah, the Judeo-Christian tradition is essential here because, and the, tr the transition in the West to move towards or tend towards more Oriental traditions is a mistake because the Oriental traditions don't really have a sophisticated understanding of ethics in the, in the way that the Judeo-Christian tradition does. And I'm not saying the Judeo-Christian tradition is the only way we should uh, view ethics. I think psychoanalysis, of course, approaches ethics and Kantian philosophy approaches ethics in a new way. Um, but the, the, the crucial paradoxes to, to um, focus on are still essentially like metaphysically religious and political in the sense of our power structures are irrational um, as evidence. I mean, I Donald Trump, for example, I mean, but any political figure, I mean, there's an, always an irrational dimension to the election of a leader or a figure, a master figure. Um, and there's always something more than just mere competence or just mere functionality. And so that's really something that I think it's, it's a, it's, it's kind of a flaw in Peterson's thinking where he's always emphasizing hierarchies of competence. But I think that, yeah, this metaphysical dimension is irrational. It's not just about competence. And um, we have to think about the nature of evil and goodness in relationship to these positions of power. And I think that that's an essential social conversation, essential for future of social theory. Um, and finally, I think Zizek really hammered home why he's a Hegelian and why he identifies as, with Hegel and not Marx, because he also feels like Peterson that that the problem with Marxism is its inherent teleological structure, basically, that the Marxist knows what world history is tending towards world communism, and they know how it will look and they know how to bring in the utopia. And this is fundamentally a problem because the future is open. And that's actually what Hegel means by absolute knowing that we don't know the, the laws of history. We don't know the, the, the future potential of human civilization. That's absolute knowing. When you think you know those things, that's ideology. You're trapped in ideology. The future is much more open. It's unknown. We don't know. It's it's to be determined by our actions. Uh, and the crucial point that Zizek makes is when we act, we fail. When we act, we fall. We don't know. We, we, we aren't self-transparent to ourselves, which is, again, the importance of understanding the unconscious. And Peterson is aware of that as well. So I think there's another point of synthesis there. Um, so that is my analysis of Zizek and Peterson debate. I was filtering it through those four categories, and I was really trying to find a way to um, articulate a horizon that is really productive and generative of new thought. And I think that that's both what they would emphasize towards the end of their debate. Peterson said, what's the point of this debate to appreciate difference between two different thinkers and to build between the, these two thinkers? And Zizek was emphasizing for the left, stop being politically correct, start thinking, start thinking really hard about difficult things, um, and let's really approach deep fundamental problems. And so that's um, what this channel is for. Um, that's what my work is for. Uh, and I hope you appreciated this video, and I hope you appreciated this analysis of Zizek and Peterson.